Hello and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining me today. So in this video, I'll be working out Math 190, the sample final for you. Uh, feel free to pause the video, work out these questions on your own, so that way you can check it with me at the end. So let's dive right into it. So let's call this our solution file. So for the first problem, we are going to be performing the indicated operation. So we're gonna simplify this as much as possible. So first we write this compounded fraction. Remember, keep change flip. So you have three times five over three minus, and the second one, we also wanna do keep change flip. So you would have three over five times, and then one over three. Now let's cancel out some common factors. We can cancel a three here and a three here. So that leaves us with a five for the first fraction minus from the second one, we can cancel out three and three. That leaves us with one over five. And now to combine these, you also need common denominators. So write this as over one. You know your common denominator is five. So multiply this five over five. And that gives you 25 over five minus one over five. Now we can subtract the top, 25 minus one, 24 over five. That is our final answer and it's simplified because five doesn't go into 24. Okay, moving on to the next problem. So for this one, we want to simplify this uh, expression and reduce it as much as we can. When you see something like this, you want a factor. So now before that, I also noticed that there's a division in the middle. So you want to turn this into a multiplication. So let's go ahead and do that. So we do the keep change clip again. So you'll keep x squared minus 16 over 2x minus 8 times we reciprocate the next fraction. So it becomes 4x over x squared plus 4x. Now you can factor everything. So on top, first fraction, x squared minus 16 can be factored into x plus 4 times x minus 4. And on the bottom, 2x minus 8, you just take out their GCF2, you get x minus 4 times. Now the next one, 4x, that's just 4x. Um, and then the bottom, take out the GCF x, you'll have x plus 4. So everything is completely factored. Now we can cancel out common factors. So common factors here are, so this is a common factor with that, and then x minus four with x minus four, x with x. Now four and two, I can also reduce them. So there you go. All of this simplifies to simply a two on top. That is our simplified answer. All right, moving on to the next problem, number three. So here is question number three. We want to uh, expand this and simplify and leave no parentheses. So let's go ahead and do that. So when you see an exponent like this, an expression on the, in, inside it has plus or minus symbol, you just write this factor as x plus five over x times x plus five over x. That's what it means for this, uh, to be raised to the second power. Now distribute, so this you distribute, you get x squared. You distribute this to that, you will get five x times x. The next term, you'll get five x times another x. And then this one with that will give you five, x, five over x times five over x, you'll get 25 over x squared. Now for the middle term, we can actually simplify like we did before. So that cancels out, you just have five plus five. So we have x squared plus 10 plus 25 over x squared. And that is our simplified answer without any parentheses. Alrighty, moving on to the next problem. So here we're going to factor. So if you want, you can come up with the substitution since it looks confusing. So pick this to be your substitution. So we're going to let maybe t equals just the inside, z minus two. 
so it's easier to see what we have. So then our expression becomes t squared, because this is replaced with t, minus 5 times t, because z minus 2 is t. And then here I can pull out the GCF, which is t, then you have t minus 5. Now it's completely factored. Now you can plug this in here. So our final answer would be z minus 2, because I'm replacing t, times t minus 5, replace z with t. So you have z minus 2 minus 5. So I just substitute it. And now here I can combine like terms. These two can be combined. You'll have z minus 2 times z minus 7. And there you have it. This is factored. Okay, so here's our next problem. This is number five. We want to solve this equation. So we can factor or you can just solve for a by isolating. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to go ahead and add one to both sides. So you have 49a squared is equal to one. Then divide both sides by 49. And that gives you a squared is equal to 1 over 49. Now here, you have to be careful because you're going to be taking a square root. When you do that, you have to put plus and minus. So a is equal to either positive 1 over 49 or negative. So we put a plus and minus. Now this can be simplified. A square root of 1 over 49 is simply square root of 1 over square root of 49. Square root of 1, we know that's 1, and square root of 49, we know that's 7. So this can be written as plus or minus 1 seventh. So there are two set of answers for this equation. It makes sense because the degree is 2, so you have two solutions. So let's go ahead and work out number 6 now. So for number 6, we're uh, solving this inequality, so we're going to treat it as an equation. So first, uh, I'm going to go ahead and distribute this 2 out to remove the parentheses. That gives me 6x minus 10 less than or equal to 4x plus 12. Now I'll start isolating x. I'm going to go ahead and add 10 to both sides. That gives me 6x less than or equal to 4x plus 22. And now we can subtract 4x from both sides. That gives us... 2x less than or equal to 22, and we can now divide by 2. So x is less than or equal to 11. So that's the inequality notation. We wanted an interval notation. So if you were to draw the solution set, let's suppose 11 is here. Now this inequality means it's equal to, so this endpoint is included, and we want less than, less than is on this side. So you can suppose zero is here and negative one and so on. So our solution, it's going to be um, using the interval notation, negative infinity all the way to 11, including 11. So that will be the final answer. All right, so here's the next problem. We want to find an equation of a line through the point negative one, two, and four, set four, three. Let's find the slope. So a line, you can write it in y equals either mx plus b form or y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1 form. This is the point slope form. This one is easier. So that's the one I'm gonna be writing it on. We'll be using that. So I need to find m. So the slope is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So let's go ahead and label our points. Call this one x1, y1, x2, y2. So our slope will set it up as 3 minus negative 2 over 4 minus negative 1. Just plugging in these numbers. So this will give us 3 plus 2, that's 5. And then 4 plus 1, that's 5. That's 1. So m is 1. Now, to write the equation, I'm going to be using that point. You can use the other point as well, same line. So we have y minus the y-coordinate equals the slope times x minus the x-coordinate. So this is y minus negative 2 is equal to 1 times x minus negative 1 
because I'm using this point right here. Now let's clear out the double negative. This is simply x plus 2 equals x plus, I'm um, sorry, this is a y. This is y minus 2, so it's y plus 2 and x plus 1. So I miswrote the notation. This is the line we're looking at. Okay, moving on to the next problem. So here we're going to be solving another quadratic equations. Let's go ahead and set it to zero. So subtract 12 from both sides. You have x squared minus 4x minus 12 equals to zero. Now here you can use the quadratic formula or factor or completing the square method. I'm gonna go ahead and factor. This is factorable. X minus six and X plus two are the factors. So if I set each factor to zero, I get X equals six and X equals negative two. So when x equals 6, this is 0. When x equals negative 2, this is 0. That's why these are the two solutions. So here's the next problem. We want to evaluate and simplify this expression using this function. So pretty much we're going to substitute a plus 1 into t. So g of a plus 1. So our function is t squared minus 1. So t is going to be replaced with a plus 1. So you do t squared minus 1 over t minus 1. So I'm leaving it blank because I'm going to replace the blank with this new input, which is a plus 1. And now I can expand and simplify. So a plus 1 squared, that's simply a plus 1 times a plus 1. We have a minus 1. And the bottom, I can drop the parentheses, so that's a plus 1 minus 1. Now simplify. Here, you're going to expand. So you will have a squared plus 2a plus 1 minus 1 from before. And on the bottom, 1 and negative 1 cancel, so it's just a. And then I'm going to go ahead and uh, combine. So you have a squared plus 2a. Uh, negative 1 and 1 cancels out over a. So now we can take this answer and simplify it a little bit further by factoring out an a on top. So you have a times a plus 2 all over a, and these will cancel out. So our final simplified answer would be just a plus 2. We're going to be performing the operation and then simplify that fraction. So since there is addition in the middle, in order for us to add them, we need to have common denominators. So our common denominator or the least common denominator is going to be one factor of this, 2x minus three. But if you look at the second fraction, it has 2x minus three squared. So we'll need 2x minus three, another factor of that. So we'll say 2x minus three squared will be the least common denominator. Now we grab our fractions and multiply them top and bottom by the LCD if they're missing the LCD. So the first one, we're missing one factor of 2x minus 3. So I'll multiply this one with 2x minus 3 over 2x minus 3. And the second one we can just rewrite because it already has the LCD. So there's nothing to multiply that one with. So for the first one, we can go ahead and distribute. That gives us 10x minus 15 over 2x minus 3 squared plus 15 over 2x minus 3 squared. Now that they have common denominator, we can join the top. You will have 10x minus 15 plus 15 all over the least common denominator. And now the 15 and negative 15 cancels out. We're left with the 10x over 2x minus 3 squared. So that will be our simplified answer to this problem. Moving on to the next problem, number 11. We want to find the maximum or the minimum value of this function. So it's a parabola. As you can see, it's degree 2. So we can use the formula the maximum or the minimum will happen at the vertex. So since this has coefficient 
x squared has coefficient negative one. It's a parabola facing downward. So this is your vertex, which is going to represent the maximum value. So let's go ahead and find that. There are many ways to do it. I'm going to go ahead and use the formula that the vertex can be computed by using x equals negative b over 2a. That'll be the x-coordinate of the vertex, and the y-coordinate will be plugging this into the function. Now rewrite the function. You can write this as negative x squared minus 4x plus 1, which will make our a value to be negative 1. That's the coefficient of x squared. b value is negative 4 and c is the constant term, 1. Plugging those into my formula, I have negative times negative 4 over 2 times negative 1. That gives us 4 over 2, negative 2. That's negative 2. So our x-coordinate of the vertex, this right here, is going to be at negative 2. Now the y-coordinate will be uh, f of negative 2, so that's 1 minus 4 times negative 2 minus negative 2 squared. And doing this very carefully, we get 1, negative 4 minus 2 times 2, that's plus 8. And then negative 2 squared is 4 times negative 1, that's negative 4. So this will give us 9 minus 4, which is equal to 5. So here's our maximum value. of this function. All right, so moving on to the next problem. Here is number 12. We're going to be solving a logarithmic equation. So using the laws of logarithm, you can combine this first. Since there is a plus between two logarithms, you can turn this into a product log base two of x times x minus three equals to two. Now here we're going to recall the definition, log base a of x equals y. This can be written as a to the power y equals x. Using that definition, I'm going to rewrite this. So this statement is equivalent to 2 to the power of 2 equals x times x minus 3. And this is a quadratic we can solve. So on the left side, we have 4. On the right side, we can distribute squared minus 3x. Now subtract 4 from both sides. You get 0 equals x squared minus 3x minus 4. So if you factor this, you'll have the following x minus um, 4 and x plus 1. So that those are the factors for this quadratic. So when you set it to 0, you'll get x equals 4 and negative 1. Now we want to check our answer, which one of these are solutions. So let's do a quick check. When I plug 4 into my original equation, I have log base 2 of 4 plus log base 2 of 4 minus 3 equals 2. Let's check. This is good. Now for x equals negative 1, uh, you will see that this wouldn't check because you'll have log base 2 of negative 1 plus whatever, everything comes after. But because of this, the logarithm cannot have negative values as its input, so this is not going to be true. So we're going to go ahead and omit this solution. So our only solution to this problem is going to be x equals 4, because that's the one that makes sense. All right, so let's go into the next problem. Here is number 13. We want to simplify this as much as we can by using laws of exponents. So I'm going to go ahead and take care of the inside. Of course, there are multiple ways to do this. You can choose whichever you prefer. A to the 4 can remain inside. Now b to the negative 3, I'm going to put that in the bottom. So you'll have b to the 4 times b to the 3. Everything to the second power. And then simplify this a little bit more. b to the 3 uh, and b to the 4, that's b to the 7th. By adding their powers to the second power, everything. And then here I can distribute the exponents. This is a to the 8th power over b to the 14th power. And that's our simplified answer to this problem. 
So here's the next one. We are given that the, um, well, here we have a problem where we want to find the length of the arc that subtends the central angle of 20 degree measure in a circle of radius 13 meter. So let's find the length. So suppose here is our picture. And suppose this is the 20 degree. And we want to find the length. So we're looking for this right here. Let's call S is the length, arc length. And we're given the radius is 20, 13. That's R. So we know the formula, the arc length is equal to R times theta. We have to remember theta has to be in radians. So we'll do a little conversion first. So let's go ahead and convert. So we have 20 degree, multiply this by pi over 180 degree. That will convert this to radians. So this is 80 of pi over, so 20 degree and 80, 180 degree, you can reduce the numbers. This is going to be nine on the bottom. So pi over nine is your angle. So now we can go ahead and plug this into our formula. So our length S is gonna be R, which is 13 times theta, that's pi over nine. So S is simply equal to 13 pi over nine. And this is good enough. So we can leave our answer in terms of pi. All right, so moving on to the next problem. So here's number 15. An angle of elevation to the top of a tall building is found to be 14 degree from the ground at a distance of 0.5 miles. Okay, so let's suppose this is the tall building. And let's suppose this is the ground and the angle of elevation. So let's just say that. Okay. So the angle of elevation so the top of the building is 14 degree. So I can call this 14 degree right here. So if you have a person standing here uh, from the person's eyesight looking upward, that's the angle of elevation. And from the ground at a distance of 0.5 meter, miles. So from here to here, this is 0.5 miles. And we want to know the height of the building. Let's call this X. So that's what we're looking for. Now, the trig ratio that we can use will be as follows. If this is my angle, this will be the opposite length. Then this is the adjacent length, and this is the hypotenuse. So you're given, or looking for opposite, you're given adjacent. So the way to relate them is to use tangent. So we can say tangent of 45 degree will be opposite over adjacent. So that will be the ratio of 0.5. And then I can multiply both sides by 0.5. So the height would be tangent of 14 degree times 0.5. So I'll just do it this way. 0.5 times tangent of 14 degree. So that will be the height of the building. And it's okay to leave our answer this way. Now for number 16, let's do the following. We want tangent inverse of square root of three, set this equal to theta. Let's do that and then apply tangent to both sides so the inverse will cancel. You'll have tangent theta is equal to square root of three. And we know this theta has to be between negative pi over two and pi over two. Now from your memory of trigonometry functions, we know that this theta has to be pi over three. So that would be the angle for this um, inverse function. Now let's go ahead and do 17. So for 17, we want to find the exact value of this cosine of seven pi over six. Let's go ahead and rewrite seven pi over six and then we'll sketch seven pi over six. You can write it as pi over six, um, 6 pi over 6 plus a pi over 6, because that's 7 pi over 6. And then 6 pi over 6, that's just pi. 
plus pi over six. So now you know this is 180 and this is 30. So when you sketch this on the xy plane, you have pi is right here, that's 180, and then 30 is a little bit more. So this angle terminates on the third quadrant. So we know that on the third quadrant from ASTC that only tangent is positive. So cosine is going to be negative. So we know that cosine of seven pi over six is equal to negative cosine of its reference angle. So let's go ahead and find the reference angle. This is the reference angle, which is pi over six. Now, if you're not sure, you can find the reference angle by doing seven pi over six, remove pi from it, you'll get pi over six. So I'm gonna replace this with pi over six. So we have cosine of pi over six in here. And now again, from memory, cosine of pi over six, you know that's square root of three over two. So our exact value is negative square root of three over two. So for number 18, we want to find sine theta if cosine theta is negative five over seven and theta is in quadrant two. All right, so let's go ahead and draw a picture. So here's our plane and here's our right triangle. So suppose theta is right here coming out from the origin. That means across from theta is your opposite. This is the adjacent, this is hypotenuse. So we know cosine, by definition, this is adjacent over hypotenuse. So we have negative five over seven which means I can call this length negative five and hypotenuse seven. So question mark is what we're looking for. Now that's another leg from the triangle. So we can use the formula a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared. So a, b are the legs. So let's call a is negative five squared plus question mark squared is equal to seven squared. Then this gives us 25 plus what we're looking for equals 49. Subtract 25 from both sides, you have question mark squared is 24. So that means the length we're looking for is square root of 24. Of course, the positive square root. And you can simplify this into four times six, and that will simplify to two root six. So that's what question mark is. So we know this length is two root six. So now what is sine then? Well, we know sine theta is opposite over hypotenuse. So that means sine would be two square root of six over seven. So that's our final answer. And we can also check that from ASTC, the sine value is gonna be positive. So that's what we got. All right, so moving on to the next part. Here's an equation we're going to be solving. Now, this is a fractional equation, so you always wanna make sure you don't get uh, solutions that will make the equation undefined. So just by looking at it, we can observe t cannot equal to negative nine because of this fraction, because it will be undefined, and t cannot equal to two because of this fraction. So with that observation, let's go ahead and multiply both sides of this equation by the LCD, which is t plus nine times t minus two. So once we do that to the left and the right side, we will have for the first on the left side, we'll have t minus two is equal to three and the right hand side will have three times t plus nine. So the denominators will cancel. And now we can go ahead and solve for t by distributing the three first. You'll have t minus two is equal to three t plus 18. That's, um, sorry, that's 27. And now we can isolate t. I'm gonna go ahead and subtract t from both sides. So that gives me two T on the right-hand side and subtract 27 from both sides. Then that will give me 29 T negative on the left-hand side. And now we can divide both sides by two. So that gives us T 
is equal to negative 29 over two. And since this is not the answer we rejected up here, that is a good answer of uh, two functions. And we wanna see if they're inverses of each other. So you're gonna compose them. You wanna show that when we do f composed with g, we get x. So we're doing f of g of x. So f of, well, g of x happens to be this function. So that's gonna be the input for f. So it's one over x plus 10. Now plug that into f, you'll have one over, x is replaced with one over x plus 10 plus 10. So that would give us one over one over x plus 20. And then this will give you, so we can uh, simplify these, combine into a single fraction. So multiply 20 by x over x. So you can put them in common denominators. You have one over one plus 20 x over x. And this simplifies to my keep flip change. You get x over one plus 20 x. Well, we don't get x, right? So because it's not equal to x, we, we don't need to prove the other direction. We can just say that f and g are not inverses of each other. So that means the uh, statement is false. So that will be our conclusion. So the statement, set, the statement says f of x is this and g of x is that. They're inverses of each other. Well, we just check one composition. We didn't get x as a result. They're not inverses of each other. All right, um, moving on to the next one. Here is a little bit of laws of exponents. So if you see negative power, make the exponent positive. So I'm going to write it like this. 27 over 1 to the power negative 2 over 3. So negative exponents on top, you can bring them on the bottom. So this is 1 over 27 to the power now 2 over 3. And you can also write this as a radical. This is 1 over cube root of 27 and then raise that to the second power. That's another way to write exponent 2 third. And cube root of 27, well, that's 3. So you have 1 over 3 squared, and that's 1 over 9. So that's how you simplify this one. All right, so here's another one, 22. So for this one, we are going to be sketching by plotting points. Now, before we plot points, take a look at the domain. This function, you want 16 minus x squared to be greater than or equal to zero. So that means if you factor this, you get four minus x and then four plus x greater than or equal to zero. So the zeros are four, and negative four. So when you plot this on the real line, you have um, negative four here and four here, and you test the interval. So I'll pick a test value and plug in. So here I can test negative um, five, something beyond negative four. Here I can test zero, here I can test five. So if I plug these into this expression, First um, parenthesis will be positive, negative, oh, sorry, I'm positive, negative times, so four minus negative five, that's positive. The second parenthesis is negative, so this is negative. When you plug in zero, you'll get positive. When you plug in five, you'll get negative and positive, so it's negative. So the only one trouble you want is that one right there. So that's the domain of this function. So you know the only thing you can plug in is from negative four to four. So the graph will only exist from negative four to four. Now let's be clever, make a table of values. Uh, for x values, we'll pick something between negative four to four. You'll get our y values, which will be depending on the function, 16 minus x squared. And we'll plot the coordinates x comma f of x. So let's plug negative four, zero, and four, just the endpoints and zero in between. Easier, you can plot more points if you want to. This is good for me. So if I plug in negative four into this 
you get negative four squared, which is 16 minus 16 is zero. So your function at negative four is zero. So the points we're gonna plug in is negative four comma zero. When you plug in zero into the function, you will, so plug in zero, you'll get 16 minus zero squared, which is square root of 16. That will be four. So you'll have zero comma four. And when you plug in four, you will have zero again. So four comma zero. I think this is good enough to see the graph. So let's go ahead and take a look at the graph. I'll make this a little bit smaller. So we have some space to graph this. So here is my xy plane. So negative four is here, or oh, closed, four is here, closed. And when x equals zero, we get four. Let's suppose this is four. And you just connect them by making a curve. So it looks just like that. So as you can see from the domain, the graph only exists from negative four to four. And that's the graph. So this is our f of x equals square root of 16 minus x squared. All righty. So moving on to 23, we're graphing a piecewise function. So here is our xy plane. And we're splitting up at 0. So let's focus on the top when x is less than 0. So that's this region right here. When x is less than zero, the function is negative one. Well, negative one, let's say it's right here. Open circle at this, because x is not equal to zero, and it's just a horizontal line. So this is the function f of x equals negative one when x is less than zero. Now, the bottom function here, it's x squared minus pi, it's a parabola, and when x is greater than or equal to zero. So plug in zero, when you plug in zero, you'll have zero squared minus five, that's negative five. So the graph will start, I'm gonna emphasize this a little bit more. So, so that way we can see that open circle at negative one. Okay, now negative five, let's suppose it's further down here. It is closed at negative five and we're gonna create a parabola facing up, perhaps something like that. So this is the function f of x equals x squared minus five on the interval x greater than or equal to zero. So that is this piecewise graph. Now, if you wanna plot another point when x is greater than zero, you can surely do that. And you'll see this is the parabola we're looking at. All right, so here's the next problem. We're going to be graphing this function by using transformations. Um, so the parent function or the standard function we're looking at, it's going to be some form of a square root because eventually you have to look like that. So this is the one we're looking at. Now this right here, x minus two inside the square root, that represents a horizontal shift. So we start with that and then we'll do two time formations. First is this right here, the reflection. So we're going to be doing negative times the function. So this is reflection over x-axis. And then this plus two right here, that's the horizontal shift. So it's f of x plus two, that's the rule. So we're going to be uh, shifting shift uh, left two units. So that will be the final sketch. So here's our xy plane. And we're going to reflect first and then shift. So square root of x, we all know by now, this is square root of x. So now let's go ahead and reflect. So I'll show you the final sketch, but you should imagine reflection along the x-axis it looks like that. So that's the negative square root of x. And now I'm going to um, shift left two units. So my final sketch is gonna be right here at negative two. And then we just preserve the shape, something like that. 
So this is our function, y equals negative the square root of x plus 2. So let's go ahead and find the y-intercept. x-intercept is there, negative 2, 0. The y-intercept, we're going to set x equals 0. You get negative square root of 2. So that will be the y-intercept of this graph. Okay, now let's go ahead and try this one. This is number 25. We're going to sketch an exponential function by using transformations. So I like to rewrite my function. So I'm going to go ahead and rewrite. This is h of x is equal to so one third to the power x plus two. One third to the power x. That can be written as three to the negative one to the power x, which is three to the negative x. So that's what I'm going to do with this. I'm going to rewrite this three to the negative x plus two. So that is the function we're sketching. And now let's identify our transformations. So we're going to start with the basic shape, which is three to the x, and then we will apply transformations. First, we're gonna apply this transformation, that negative with the independent variable x. So that's a reflection. So if you have f of negative x, that's going to be the reflection over the y-axis. And then this plus two right here, that's f of x plus two outside, that's going to go up two units. And then we have our picture. So these are the transformation we're going to be going through. Let's go ahead and draw them. So by now we know that the exponential functions, they look like this if the base is greater than one. So something like this, this is, let's call that three to the X. And it has a horizontal asymptote Y equals zero. I'm gonna go ahead and reflect. Before that, I wanna label this point, that's zero one. So reflect along the Y axis, it will look something like this. And then from there, we're gonna go up um, two units. So the point, uh, zero, zero, 1 will travel two units up, so it's going to be at 3, and the horizontal asymptote will travel two units up as well, so it'll be right here. So that's the new horizontal asymptote, y equals 2, and now just create the shape. So our graph will look something like this. So the red is our final sketch, that is our h of x equals one third x, one third to the x plus two. So we know that we can also fill in a little bit more information. The domain of this function is all real numbers. The range of this function is from the asymptote, so two to infinity, and there is a horizontal asymptote at y equals two. So these are also information we should know just by looking at the graph. All right, so that's the end of the test. I hope you enjoyed. Take care.